Story 1 The words tumbled out, heavy and resolute. James, I said, I want a divorce. His face, normally a mask of corporate confidence, crumpled in surprise. A wife questioning his authority? Unthinkable. His initial shock morphed into anger, a simmering rage bubbling beneath the surface. Being CEO had inflated his ego, leaving little room for responsibility or introspection. This neglect cast a long shadow, chilling both our home life and his business. Fine, he spat, his voice laced with disdain. But you take care of all four kids alone. No child support, no alimony. His cavalier dismissal of his parental obligations was breathtaking. Two of the children, Michael, 15, and Sophia, 14, were from his previous marriage. But love transcended biology. All four were mine in every way that mattered. Taking a deep breath, I steeled myself. Hard as it would be, I would raise them. After the divorce and the move to our new, smaller home, James's sudden reappearance on the doorstep was a shock. A silent laugh bubbled up within me. Reality had finally bitten, hadn't it? Enjoy the harvest, I thought wryly. From here on out, he would face the consequences of his own actions. Life hadn't always been this way. At 34, I thrived as a stay-at-home mom, our bustling household a symphony of activity. Michael, Sophia, Jack, Eight, and Ava, Six, filled our days with laughter, squabbles, and the sweet chaos of childhood. James, now 39, was the CEO of a successful manufacturing company. Nine years earlier, we had remarried, drawn together by a shared love and a second chance. Michael and Sophia belonged to James's previous marriage, his wife having passed away 12 years prior. Fate then intervened in the form of Mr. Wilson, a major shareholder in James's company. This enigmatic mentor, met at a bar shortly after our remarriage, showered James with business opportunities and guidance. Mr. Wilson's investment fueled our company's growth, but success had a dark side. My first impression of James, when I worked as a receptionist at one of his associates' firms, couldn't have been more charming. A refreshing CEO, he always greeted the receptionist with a disarming smile and a genuine take care as he left. Back then, he seemed approachable, genuinely kind. But marriage and success transformed him. Arrogance crept in, a serpent coiling around his heart. His company's growth fed his disdain for others, manifested at home in neglected chores and at work in disregarded employees. One day, his dismissal of my workload grated on me. Stay-at-home moms have it easy, right? He scoffed. Naps in the afternoon? This flippant remark ignited a simmering resentment. Excuse me? I countered, voice steady despite the tremor in my heart. Preparing meals for six, packing lunches, endless laundry, cleaning, shopping. Where exactly is this downtime? Beyond the physical demands, James's absence was deafening. Sophia's looming high school entrance exams, Eva's constant needs, Michael's late soccer practices, and Jack's homework pleas, a household orchestra playing without its conductor. The tension crackled in the air. That's why I provide for the household, right? James scoffed. But a little help goes a long way. You could help Michael with homework or guide Sophia through college applications. His words were hollow. By the time James arrived home, Michael was already asleep. Sophia, burdened by exams, likely sought solace in her mother's understanding. Be a mother, he demanded, oblivious to his own failings. My voice trembled with frustration. You slam the table and call me the irresponsible one? You spend evenings at the bar and weekends on the golf course. Work isn't a constant excuse for late nights, nor are weekend escapes your due. Stay home then, he retorted. Just bring in the same kind of money. Until then, don't lecture me about responsibility. His deflection was infuriating. James's neglect extended beyond our home. The children, once drawn to their father, now retreated at his approach. He remained oblivious, blaming his incompetent employees for the company's woes. There are a lot of useless people out there these days, he'd rant. Offer training, I suggested. Mentor them. Investing in people pays dividends. Costs too much, he'd scoff. Can't waste resources on those who can't do their jobs. But a strong workforce is the backbone of any business, I countered. His refusal to acknowledge this basic principle was disheartening. His reign as CEO was marked by rash decisions. 
The department head bungled the expansion project, he declared, announcing a demotion. That was your idea, I reminded him. You guaranteed its success. His response was predictable. Don't tell me about running a business. Even Mr. Wilson, his enigmatic benefactor, started expressing concern. Apparently, James's request for additional funding had been denied. The company risks collapse, Mr. Wilson warned. James, however, remained defiant. He refused to accept responsibility, blaming others for his own shortcomings. His arrogance was a wall against any attempt at reason. One evening, Michael returned from school, a storm brewing in his eyes. He showed me a video on his phone. James, arm linked with a young woman disappearing into a hotel. Tears welled up. His failures as a husband, a father, a CEO, all laid bare. There, in front of my son, I crumbled under the weight of his betrayal. Tears streamed down my face as Michael awkwardly patted my back. I'm so sorry, Michael, I choked out. I, I think I'm going to divorce your father. Michael surprised me. He didn't erupt in protest, just offered a quiet, It's okay, Mom. It's your decision. But then, a flicker of worry crossed his face. What about Sophia and me? I looked up, startled. Michael, now taller than me, held a genuine concern in his eyes. Oh, honey, I said, extending a hand to ruffle his hair. Of course, if you're okay with it, you both will live with me. A hesitant smile bloomed on Michael's face. We might have some financial struggles, though. With a watery laugh, I wiped a tear away. We'll figure it out together, I promise. Before I could sink further into despair, Michael interrupted. That's okay, Mom. As long as you're here, I'm not worried. I won't be a real manager, will I? Confused, I asked, why would you say that? Michael's smile turned confident. Because I know you wouldn't abandon us. His words sparked a flicker of determination within me. Refusing to be a victim, I hired a private investigator. Evidence gathered quickly. Photos of James entering hotels with a young woman, clearly an employee from his company. A week later, I told the children about my decision. I intended to get full custody, hoping they'd choose to come with me. That night, James arrived home late, oblivious to the storm brewing within me. As he cheerfully tossed his tie aside, I slammed a picture on the table, the one Michael had taken. I can't take it anymore, James, I stated, voice firm. We're getting a divorce. The photo landed face up, a stark image of his infidelity. Shock momentarily flickered on his face, quickly replaced by a familiar anger. His pride wouldn't tolerate being exposed, especially by me. Fine, he scoffed. You raise all four kids on your own. Don't expect a dime in child support or alimony. With a dismissive laugh, he displayed a complete lack of responsibility. But I had already made my choice. No matter the hardship, I would raise them myself. Okay, I said, staring him down. We'll see who comes out on top here. The next day, a surprise awaited me. Mom, there's someone I want you to meet, Michael announced. While cleaning, Michael and Sophia had arrived with an elderly gentleman. He exuded an air of kindness and smiled warmly. It's a pleasure to meet you, Lydia, he said. My name is Wilson. My mind reeled. Wait, Mr. Wilson, as in... A gentle chuckle escaped his lips. Yes, the major shareholder of James's company. I appreciate all you've done for us, Lydia. Confused, I looked between the kids and Mr. Wilson. Did they know him? Sensing my disorientation, Sophia giggled. Actually, Mom, she said, he's our grandfather. My mouth hung open in astonishment. They all laughed at my reaction. Mr. Wilson cleared his throat. Allow me to explain, he began. I am James's first wife's father. We divorced when my daughter was very young. Work consumed me then. While he had consistently paid child support after the divorce, there'd been no contact. After retirement, a pang of regret hit him. He yearned to reconnect with his daughter, now a woman, and see if she was happy. A hired detective revealed the tragic news of Sophia's mother's passing. But then came the discovery of grandchildren, being raised by their father, James. Mr. Wilson planned to introduce himself, offering support if James needed it as a single parent. However, right around that time, James and I had remarried. Feeling awkward, Mr. Wilson kept his identity hidden during their encounter at the bar. A flicker of surprise crossed Mr. Wilson's face. 
Ah, uh, yes, he replied. Apparently, about three years ago, he bumped into Michael and Sophia on their way home from school. He introduced himself as their grandfather, and they've been in touch ever since. A wave of relief washed over me. The children weren't completely isolated. Michael told me about your divorce, Mr. Wilson continued. At first, I was thinking of just offering some financial assistance. He trailed off, gazing at me thoughtfully. But, I prompted, a tremor in my voice. Michael also told me about James's affair with an employee and what he says about you both at home. He paused, a deep frown etching lines on his forehead, and how you've responded to all of it. Shame flushed my cheeks. He doesn't speak kindly of anyone. Mr. Wilson nodded grimly. He probably learned that from James blaming and speaking ill of his employees. I've been aware of the complaints from his staff for some time now. I had hoped he'd come around, but I've been quite disappointed in him. Hearing someone else acknowledge James's behavior, especially regarding the affair with an employee, was oddly comforting. Especially blaming your subordinates for your own mistakes, Mr. Wilson continued. That's not what a leader does. As a businessman himself, Mr. Wilson had a clear vision of what leadership entailed. That said, Lydia, he added, his voice growing serious, I have a request for you. A month flew by in a whirlwind of activity. With Mr. Wilson's help, we secured a spacious apartment with four bedrooms to comfortably house all of us. The down payment, generously covered by Mr. Wilson, filled me with an overwhelming sense of gratitude. You're gonna have to work hard from here on out, Lydia, Mr. Wilson said with a warm smile on the day we moved in. The kids, surprisingly helpful, made the transition smoother than I could have hoped. A few days later, the doorbell's insistent ring shattered the afternoon quiet. It continued incessantly, followed by a loud, frantic knocking. Peeking through the security camera, I saw James Wright at the entrance. Furious, I flipped on the intercom. How do you know where I live? How did you get in? Hired a detective, he grunted. Open the door. Excuse me? I'm not letting you in. The knocking intensified. Please, open up. Reluctantly, and with the sole purpose of avoiding a scene, I opened the door a crack. So, what do you want? I crossed my arms, refusing to budge. Shareholder meeting, he blurted. You still have shares, right? Yes, I do. They're discussing removing me as CEO. Oppose it for me. His desperation was palpable. Did he approach every shareholder with this same strategy? I can't get in touch with Mr. Wilson, he continued, his voice laced with panic. Is even Mr. Wilson trying to remove me? Why is this happening? A silent chuckle bubbled up within me. James, finally facing the consequences of his actions, was a sight to behold. Controlling my amusement, I said with an indifferent shrug, Who knows? But my answer is clear. I'm in favor of your removal. The color drained from his face. Leave, I said, my voice firm. And a piece of advice. No CEO worth his salt abandons work to do this kind of thing in the middle of the day. Closing the door, a sense of satisfaction settled over me. The tables had turned, and James was about to learn a valuable lesson in reaping what you sow. The day of the shareholder meeting arrived. James, sporting dark circles under his eyes, entered the venue. Mr. Wilson greeted me with a curt nod, his face etched with sternness. The moderator called the meeting to order and the proceedings began. The tension in the room was as thick as fog. News of James's potential dismissal crackled through the air, buzzing among the shareholders. Some advocated for his immediate removal, while Mr. Wilson surprisingly urged restraint. We need him to understand the reasons for this, he declared, his gaze fixed on James, who appeared on the verge of tears. It was inconceivable. The man who had always showered James with kindness now seemed his biggest adversary. Mr. Wilson cleared his throat and began reading from a document, detailing James's misdemeanors. Employee complaints, meticulously researched over a month, formed the bulk of the evidence. Testimonials and recorded audio confirmed a pattern of abusive behavior. James's outbursts echoed in the hall, his voice dripping with disdain as he belittled his employees. You're so incompetent. Is that why the performance is bad? Shame burned on the faces of some shareholders, a stark contrast to the smugness James harbored for so long. On the large screen, a video clip played, capturing a brutal scene. James striking an older employee on the head with a bundle of papers. 
A collective gasp filled the room. This wasn't just bad-mouthing at home. James had become a tyrant at work. This was the culmination of his arrogance, his delusion of being favored, and his blatant disregard for Mr. Wilson's warnings. Desperation flickered in James's eyes as he attempted to defend himself. It's not true. They kept bringing up ideas without showing results. But his words were drowned out by a chorus of disapproval. Did you really need to go that far? A shareholder boomed. Attacking with papers. And the audio, the footage. It's malicious. I'm being framed, James insisted. He pointed out the lack of context in the recordings, claiming they were selectively edited to serve a malicious agenda. Even the footage is silent. You don't know what they said to me. While some shareholders acknowledged the need for a fair investigation, none were swayed by James's self-serving claims. As he continued to protest, Mr. Wilson and I exchanged a knowing glance. James's resistance was fueling the fire, exposing him further. Oblivious to the hole he was digging, he sputtered incoherently. Finally, a voice rose from the crowd. It was the former head of the planning division. After the CEO's disastrous venture failed, he stated, I was demoted, even though I followed all his instructions. James bristled. That's not true. You failed, not me. Standing firm, the former head countered calmly. I simply followed instructions. Frustration contorted James's face. He glanced around, bewildered. His gaze landed on me. Wait, a shareholder said, surprise evident. Isn't that Lydia, the CEO's former wife? Mr. Wilson nodded. Yes, could you share your thoughts on this? His request spurred me to stand. My voice, though firm, held no malice. The CEO is responsible for everything in the company. That's what being a CEO means. A wave of agreement echoed through the room, mirrored by Mr. Wilson's satisfied nod. Hold on, James interrupted, a desperate plea in his voice. I may have demoted him, but I didn't fire him. The company, meaning me, bore the losses. Does that warrant dismissal? His lack of remorse hung heavy in the air. This man, seemingly oblivious to the damage he'd caused, stood before them unrepentant. Mr. Wilson, his face grim, interjected. There's more. James's already pale face drained of color. More? Mr. Wilson confirmed it with a chilling nod. Then, on the screen, a picture flashed. James, arm in arm with a young woman entering a hotel. A stunned gasp escaped James's lips. Before he could react, he lunged at me, rage contorting his features. Thankfully, several shareholders restrained him. Lydia, you showed this to Mr. Wilson? He snarled. Mr. Wilson shook his head curtly. No, she didn't. James pivoted, confusion clouding his face. Huh? Then who? A soft voice filled the room. My grandson, Michael, came the reply. James's eyes widened. Grandson? Michael? His voice, choked with disbelief, echoed in the tense silence. Mr. Wilson offered a small, knowing smile. Perhaps if I told you Michael and Sophia are my grandchildren, things might make more sense. James's jaw slackened, and his bravado crumbled. He sank heavily to his knees. So all this time, the one who's been supporting me, because my daughter was in your care, and you were raising my grandchildren? His voice cracked. I believed in you, James, Mr. Wilson continued, his tone heavy with disappointment. But you've changed. Did you truly believe pushing Lydia aside and expecting her to raise the kids alone, without a dime from you, wouldn't have consequences? James remained huddled on the floor, clutching his head as the weight of his actions sank in. Sobs racked his body. Furthermore, Mr. Wilson's voice boomed through the room, silencing the murmurs among the shareholders. The woman in the photograph that ultimately led to the CEO's divorce is an employee at James's company. Gasps rippled through the crowd. Meaning, Mr. Wilson continued, his voice laced with disgust, the CEO made unwelcome advances on a subordinate while still married. James mumbled incoherently, his forehead still pressed to the floor. Stop it! Please stop! Mr. Wilson's piercing gaze swept over the room. Do you think a man who treats his employees with such disrespect and betrays his wife's trust deserves to remain CEO? The answer was unanimous. James was dismissed. In the aftermath, with Mr. Wilson's unwavering support, 
I stepped into the role of CEO. He saw potential in me, impressed by my earlier suggestions of training programs and mentorship initiatives for struggling employees. I also gained the confidence of other shareholders, and together with the dedicated staff, we began the process of rebuilding the company. James and his mistress, unable to bear the shame and scrutiny, found employment elsewhere. I demanded fair compensation for my years of dedication, forcing James to sell his house to meet the settlement. Apparently, the revelation and public humiliation were too much for his girlfriend. She left him, hurling a final barrage of insults before disappearing from his life. Life for us, however, took a turn for the better. We settled happily into a spacious apartment, a family of five. Mr. Wilson, whom the kids affectionately called Jack, often visited after work to help with childcare. Michael and Sophia even started taking initiative, preparing dinner and waiting up for me on late nights. Every day I filled with a deep sense of gratitude for Mr. Wilson, my incredible children, and the second chance at happiness life had given me. The future stretched before us, brimming with possibilities. We were ready to face it, stronger and more united than ever. Story 2 I used to pay $2,800 per month, but my Emil told me that I have to leave because my son and DIL are moving back after having a baby. The eviction notice came disguised as a cup of lukewarm tea. My mother-in-law, a woman whose smile never reached her eyes, announced, David and Samantha are coming home to have the baby in three days. Confused, I blinked. Amy? Yes, you, she continued, her tone colder than yesterday's leftovers. We don't need you to play the role of a mother anymore. You've served your purpose a long time ago. Now, David and his family will live here, so please leave by tomorrow. Years of simmering resentment boiled over. I had known I wasn't truly accepted since the wedding day, but to be tossed aside like yesterday's trash? You're a failure who can't bear children, she sneered. We allowed you to experience child rearing. You should be grateful. We have no obligation to support you anymore. Even Michael is tired of you. Michael, too? I swallowed the lump in my throat. If this wasn't a conspiracy between them, then my consideration for my husband was officially over. Foolish, I thought, bitterness creeping in. They light the fuse, but they'll be the ones facing the explosion. Let them deal with the reality they'd conveniently ignored for years. Introducing Chloe Robinson, 45 years old, wife, and unofficial maid in a bustling New York household. We live near the station, a prime location that came with a hefty price tag. My husband, Michael, a newly minted section chief, had insisted on the convenience. Eight years my senior and divorced, Michael exuded an aura of calm that had initially drawn me in. We met through a friend and married after two years. Even after learning I couldn't have children due to a past illness, he remained kind. My feelings, in turn, were unwavering. I know it's asking a lot, Michael had said before the wedding, a first-time bride living with a son and mother-in-law, but I promise to make you happy. We can even move to a bigger apartment if you feel cramped here. David, his son from his first marriage, was turning ten. With Michael's mother around to help, I figured my role wouldn't be too demanding. There's no need to be a mother, Michael had reassured me. David's grandma will handle most of the child care. Upon meeting David, his frosty demeanor was clear. I chalked it up to shyness, or a typical pre-teen phase. As long as he tolerated me, I was fine. My mother-in-law, a woman of quiet elegance, seemed pleasant enough during our first encounter. I naively believed we could get along. I'll handle the meals, I'd volunteered then. Michael often works late, so erratic schedules shouldn't be a problem. And cleaning and laundry? she'd inquired. Of course, I'd readily agreed. After the wedding, I went part-time at the pharmacy, adjusting my mornings to fit in housework. By the time I arrived home around 8 p.m., dinner was always waiting. Little did I know it wouldn't be for long. The supposed benefit of living with my in-laws quickly soured. They'd have their meals early, leaving me to eat alone each evening. Though lonely, I brushed it off as our style. Little did I know, my acceptance into the family was never an option for my mother-in-law. One day, I approached David, still a stranger in our own home. Hey David, your sports day is coming up, right? Can we all go cheer you on? David stammered a hesitant reply, but
but before he could finish, my mother-in-law interjected. Michael and I will go, she declared, her voice devoid of warmth. No need for you to worry about it, Chloe. Misinterpreting her dismissal as kindness, I offered to take a day off. We can all go together. Her response was a chilling reminder of my outsider status. You're Michael's wife, she stated coldly. For David, the family is just him and Michael. Floored, I confided in Michael that night. Mom seems very attached to David. Does she think I'm trying to take him away? He brushed it off with a promise to talk to her. From that year's sports day on, I participated as a mother figure. But opportunities for genuine connection with David remained scarce. He sometimes seemed on the verge of talking, but my mother-in-law always intervened. Years later, the truth emerged. She'd been poisoning David's mind, whispering lies. Chloe said she'd be happy alone with Daddy if you were gone. Isn't she awful? Daddy's being deceived. No wonder David, at a vulnerable age, developed distrust towards me. It's horrifying, but back then, I couldn't fathom such betrayal from my own family. After high school, David moved in with his girlfriend, eventually marrying her without a ceremony. His departure surprisingly coincided with my mother-in-law's domestic strike. Household chores became my sole responsibility. She'd sit glumly at the table waiting for my return, then launch into a tirade about my cooking. Inefficient! It'll take you all night! I hadn't cooked much before, relying heavily on her. Every dish I prepared was subject to her withering criticism. Tasteless! Good thing David never had to eat this! It wasn't just the food. Laundry, cleaning, previously untouched areas became battlegrounds. Her complaints escalated. Wrinkled clothes, unvacuumed corners. Can't you do anything right? She'd sneer. Didn't your parents teach you anything? As she belittled my family, frustration clenched my fists. How did you even land Michael? She'd mock. You can't be that charming. Her parting shot became a daily ritual. If it weren't for you, David wouldn't have left. David's absence undoubtedly left a gaping hole in her life. Maybe it was an empty nest syndrome played out at my expense. If enduring her vitriol gave her solace, I tried to rationalize. But for how long? This wasn't a life. It was a slow descent into misery. Something had to change. The turning point in my torment arrived with a joyous announcement. Samantha's pregnancy. David's wife, our first daughter-in-law, was expecting. My mother-in-law beamed like never before. A baby from David! It's definitely going to be cute. Oh, my first grandchild! Their happiness mirrored my own but my mother-in-law's delight was a different breed entirely. It all stemmed from David's request. Grandma, can Samantha give birth at the hospital near you and stay here after? With Samantha's parents an hour away by plane and lacking local support, they turned to our home. Naturally, my mother-in-law couldn't refuse David. Phone calls from David became a daily occurrence, and my mother-in-law's energy spiked. From cleaning David's room and prepping futons to crafting a mile-long baby item list, she was consumed by grandchild fever. As expected, my role upon returning from work was to assist. Chloe, she'd announce, I've swept David's room. Please wipe the floors and windows and wax them, of course. We're going to the department store for baby beds next holiday. Cleaning and waxing after a long workday was grueling, and any shortcuts were met with demands to redo them. To top it off, my mother-in-law began requesting money, and before I knew it, the house overflowed with baby supplies. Chloe, please withdraw some money tomorrow. I found something for the baby. But wouldn't it be better to choose with Samantha and David? After all, it's their baby, I ventured, my voice strained. Such a cold thing to say, she snapped. It's Michael's grandchild. You're not blood-related to David, are you? Not like it matters to you, right? That's not true, I protested. I just think Samantha would want to say in choosing things for her own child. Perhaps I hit a nerve because she glared at me, stormed off, and remained fuming the next morning. My husband, leaving for a business trip, peeked through her door. I'm off, Mom. Don't dampen her excitement about the baby. She hasn't been herself since David left. You were worried too, weren't you? Yes, but at this rate we'll be broke before they arrive, I confessed. My husband's immediate scowl took me aback. Are you saying my earnings aren't enough? No, that's not what I meant. He left with a disgruntled expression, leaving me frustrated. 
money matters were always a source of tension. As the one managing our finances, I couldn't help but worry about the future. We'd been married for 13 years, and while our life together was comfortable, my mother-in-law's financial demands were creating a rift. Michael had offered a solution dip into my part-time job savings. But I considered that money, saved diligently over the years, to be a shared asset. This was just another example of how my position in the family remained precarious. Financial strain had become a constant hum in our lives. Michael's company was struggling, his salary cut to two-thirds of what it was five years ago when we married. Retirement seemed a distant dream, yet he clung to his manager title, perhaps for my mother-in-law's approval. To maintain our standard of living, I secretly covered the rent, shielding Michael's pride. One day, I left work early, hoping to mend fences with my mother-in-law. Finding her at the table, I swallowed my pride. I'm so sorry about yesterday. I spoke out of turn. She offered no response, instead dropping a bombshell. David and Samantha are coming home to have the baby, so you should leave. Confused, I blinked. Amy? Yes, you, she continued, her voice icy. We don't need a mother figure anymore. You've served your purpose a long time ago. David and his family will be living here. Please leave by tomorrow. Years of simmering resentment boiled over. I had known I wasn't truly family, treated as Michael's wife but never embraced. Yet, this blatant cruelty was a new low. We allowed you to experience child-rearing, she sneered. You should be grateful. We have no obligation to support you anymore. Even Michael is tired of you. Michael, too? I choked back a sob. Was the strain in our marriage not just distance? Had I been so naive? Perhaps a business trip wasn't the reason for his recent absence, she continued, planting a seed of doubt. Numb, I mumbled. Understood, I'll eat out tonight. Grabbing my bag, I stumbled out, a storm raging within. My heart yearned to confront Michael, but his unanswered calls and the company's confirmation that he wouldn't be back until the day after tomorrow fueled my suspicions. Tears streamed down my face as despair morphed into a fierce resolve. Was this truly my life? Betrayal gnawed at me. Seeking solace, I found myself drawn to the bar near the station, a place frequented during happier times. The owner, a man of few words, recognized me with a slight nod. Long time no see, I said, surprised by the small smile that touched my lips. This familiar environment offered a sliver of comfort. I ordered a beer and grilled chicken, the chill momentarily soothing the ache in my heart. My phone screen flickered, displaying a picture of David, a young man now in a suit we had chosen together. It was a time I desperately wished could have been different. As I sipped my beer, a plan began to form. A quick search identified a moving company for the next day. A couple of junk buyer numbers went into my favorites list. It was time to clear the decks and reclaim my life. A strange clarity washed over me as I changed my phone's wallpaper. The bitterness of betrayal had receded, replaced by a cold resolve. The beer and chicken tasted surprisingly good, each bite fueling my newfound determination. Heading home, I planned to strategize, but fate had other plans. Excuse me, Mrs. Robinson, a voice called out. I turned to see a young waitress looking flustered. Yes, that's me, I replied, curious. I saw your phone wallpaper, she blurted. Is that your husband? It felt like a divine intervention. Yes, I confirmed. Maybe it's not my place, but... She hesitated, then blurted, Your husband, he seems to be having an affair with one of our part-time employees. The waitress's righteous anger explained the owner's earlier expression. She's young, the girl continued. And they're always talking whenever the restaurant's slow. Even after closing, they leave together. Way too close for comfort. A bitter smile played on my lips. So, my mother-in-law hadn't been entirely wrong. The anger that bubbled within me was exhilarating, a stark contrast to the leaden weight of sadness. I immediately booked the moving company I'd saved earlier. My loyalty to Michael was gone. Their conspiracy had severed the last thread. They, not I, were foolish to push me out. What became of their precious house wasn't my concern anymore. Packing until midnight, a steely resolve replaced my earlier hesitation. At 2 p.m. sharp, the movers arrived. Leaving today, I announced, taking everything I bought. 
my mother-in-law sputtered. But the furniture, the appliances, we can't live like this. Leaving no trace, I countered, a hint of amusement in my voice. Fresh start for everyone tomorrow. Ignoring her protests, I oversaw the removal of everything I'd furnished the house with. My part-time job had covered most non-rent expenses, so they were rightfully mine. Panic flickered in my mother-in-law's eyes as each item left. Chloe, wait, she shrieked. Enjoy your new life with Michael and David, I said, unable to stifle a laugh. Leaving her speechless, I pocketed the keys and walked out. I'd arranged to store my belongings and planned to stay with a colleague for the time being. Exhausted but strangely exhilarated, I slept soundly that night. A week later, Michael finally attempted contact. Perhaps an attempt with his paramour had fallen through. Just then, a message arrived from the bar girl. Got a good picture. It was a photo of Michael, not with a young woman, but engrossed in conversation with a woman who wasn't exactly youthful either. The girl, perhaps feeling a renewed sense of justice, must have followed them after closing. Attached were photos of them entering a hotel. The affair was ongoing, shattering the last shred of doubt. I messaged her back. Need her name and address. This wasn't just about revenge. It was about reclaiming my life and leaving them with a mess of their own making. With the incriminating photos safely stored, my phone buzzed the next day. It was Michael. Where are you? David and Samantha are here. Aren't you coming back soon? No, I replied, my voice firm. Your mother told me to leave. I'm done. A beat of silence followed. Aren't David and Samantha going to live here together? Apparently, I said, my sarcasm dripping. Seems they're strapped for cash, vocational school, a string of part-time jobs, that kind of thing. But I want you to come back, he pleaded. I heard at the pharmacy you're taking a break. Do you have a place to stay? I'm fine, I assured him, the bite in my voice unmistakable. Don't worry about me. Your mom and David must be ecstatic. No more me to boss around. Michael was speechless, finally forced to confront his family's behavior. I hung up, needing a different kind of closure. Later that day, I returned to the house. It felt foreign, filled with unfamiliar furniture and appliances. David and Samantha sat stiffly on the sofa, acknowledging me with a curt nod. My mother-in-law glared from her armchair, creating a suffocating atmosphere. David broke the silence. What do you want? You took everything, like some kind of demon. I bought it, I took it, I corrected him coolly. Just following your wishes, a clean break. But that doesn't make sense, he scoffed. A part-time pharmacy job can't afford all that. My husband hadn't shared the truth. A flicker of guilt crossed his face as I spoke. Michael and I have been combining our incomes for years. So then the stuff you took is ours too, right? David pressed, confused. Taking control of the narrative, I continued. Michael's company has been struggling. His salary took a nosedive. For the past five years, I've been covering the gap. Now I pay the rent too. My mother-in-law's eyes widened in surprise. I'm not just a part-time worker, I clarified, meeting her gaze. I'm a pharmacist, and my hourly rate is excellent. In fact, I make more than Michael now. Michael shifted uncomfortably under my words. My mother-in-law darted glances between us, her composure shaken. From now on, David pays rent, she declared, her voice strained. You're living here, costing your grandmother plenty already. It's time to give back. David, caught off guard, sputtered. How much? $2,400, she stated. Do your best. My role as mother figure is over, I announced, my voice devoid of emotion. There's no obligation left. Get it together, David. You're about to be a father. He shook his head in disbelief, muttering, Impossible. But Samantha's voice rose above the murmurs. Wait, $2,400? You said we wouldn't have to pay rent or bills. I quit my job. Panic flickered across David's face. My salary is only $1,200. What are we going to do? I fought back a laugh. Don't worry, Samantha. You can find a cheaper place, right? After all, Michael still has a decent salary. A sliver of hope flickered on her face, quickly replaced by another concern. But I'm considering legal action against Michael and his mistress. Life might still be tough. 
As she burst into tears, Michael finally interjected, a frantic edge to his voice. What are you talking about? The venom in my mother-in-law's voice dripped through the phone. There's another woman, Chloe. I told Michael it's best you leave. A new woman? I scoffed. That's a lie and you know it. Michael, probably assuming I didn't have proof, jumped in. Honey, it's not what it sounds like. Ten days away from that suffocating house had sharpened my resolve. No, Michael, it's exactly what it sounds like. And who's Evelyn? The name hit him like a slap. Silence hung heavy for a moment. Look, he sighed, defeated. Let's talk about this later. We can meet with a lawyer. Lawyers it is then, I interrupted, handing him a business card. Here's mine. The room seemed to hold its breath. My husband and David exchanged a helpless glance. As I rose, handbag clutched tightly, my mother-in-law erupted. Her voice, surprisingly powerful for an older woman, boomed, What's the meaning of this? This mess is all your fault. Years of pent-up frustration ignited within me. You want to talk about mess? You told me to leave. You poisoned Michael's mind with lies. You sabotaged my relationship with David. A hot wave of regret washed over me. Why hadn't I pushed harder? ignored her meddling. You were supposed to be his wife. Support him. Be a family, she continued, oblivious to my internal turmoil. Family? If it weren't for her machinations, urging David back and hinting at infidelity, I'd still be there, supporting them all. My loyalty to Michael had never wavered. But that role, whatever it was, was over. From the beginning, I said, meeting her gaze steadily, I was never part of the family, so this family responsibility doesn't apply to me. Her lips thinned into a white line, her body trembling. I ignored her, making a swift exit. The divorce proceedings were swift. Presented with undeniable evidence, Michael couldn't fight it. I filed a separate lawsuit against both him and Evelyn for emotional distress, seeking a fair settlement. Their response was immediate. They planned to move out. As for David and Samantha, they moved back to their apartment, never to return to my mother-in-law's clutches. Michael, ever the charmer, considered remarrying. However, Evelyn wasn't thrilled with the prospect of alimony and sharing a roof with his mother. He even considered placing his mother in a facility. A pang of sympathy hit me. The son and granddaughter she adored, deserting her? Perhaps her mother-in-law role was coming to an end too. Would things have been different if she hadn't interfered? Maybe a simple homecoming birth, just us? An apology letter arrived from David, after the finalization of the divorce. He confessed to wanting to be spoiled as a child, how his grandma's disapproval silenced him, and how happy he was when I attended his school events. He wished we'd reached out more, hinted at a different relationship possibility. Although our paths diverged, a silent prayer escaped my lips for his future happiness. I returned to my job and found a new apartment close by. Feeling surprisingly light without the constant bullying, I decided to let go of the past. The furniture and appliances, once a source of security, now felt tainted. I contacted a specialist disposal company and had it all hauled away. Life without the negativity felt serene. It was time to focus on myself and prioritize my own happiness, a concept that had been foreign for far too long. Story 3 My daughter-in-law fell down the stairs and hurt herself, and my son accused me of pushing her. A world shattered in a moment. Robert, my son, stood above me, fists clenched, disappointment etched on his face. Jessica says you pushed her, he growled. I'm calling the police. Robert, no, I stammered, but the world tilted as a blow sent me sprawling. Pain bloomed across my cheek, warm and metallic. Jessica propped up on crutches in the doorway, offered a sickeningly sweet smile. Before I could protest further, Linda, my daughter, burst in with a police officer. Arrest this woman, she cried, rushing to my side. Not our mother, Robert interjected, confusion flickering across his features. What? Linda sputtered. She attacked Jessica. That's when Robert pulled out his phone, his face grim. The evidence it revealed would expose Jessica's web of deceit. Six months prior. At 63, I found myself living a peaceful life with my daughter, Linda. Her singleness, at 33, was a minor source of worry, 
but her career in a female-dominated field made up for it. Then, the phone rang, breaking the comfortable routine. Hey, Mom, Robert's voice crackled through the line. Got transferred to your city next month. Excitement battled with surprise. Next month? So soon? Robert, married and living across the state, explained his company's relocation policy. Jessica can't find an apartment she likes, he added. Can we stay with you until she does? Jessica, his young 23-year-old wife, beautiful and seemingly incompatible with my 37-year-old son. But love was a curious flame, and Robert was hopelessly smitten. Our location's perfect for commuting, he continued, mentioning the recently built mall that had boosted our neighborhood's desirability. Let's talk it over this Sunday, I suggested. Family Reunion The house buzzed as Robert and Jessica finally arrived. Apologies tumbled from their lips, and for a moment Jessica appeared a vision of youthful charm. A granddaughter returned. We want to buy a house someday, Jessica announced over dinner, but we're saving up. She seemed more mature than my first impression. However, Robert's constant relocation worried me. We don't want to uproot future kids, Robert added. They shouldn't have to keep saying goodbye to friends. Oh, Robert, I choked back a laugh. I never thought you'd think that way. A warmth spread through me at the prospect of grandchildren. Perhaps a six-month stay, I offered, a compromise. Linda has her own life? We'll find a place before then, Robert assured me. We'll share living expenses, too. I'll find a job here, Jessica chimed in. Relief washed over me. My concerns about the age difference seemed unfounded. Jessica seemed thoughtful and dependable. Present day. The image of the happy family shattered. Robert looked at the phone screen, then at Jessica, his jaw clenched. The officer reviewed the evidence, a video of Jessica feigning a stumble before pushing herself down the stairs. The truth, like a tide, rolled in. Jessica, manipulative and calculating, had played us all. Our temporary cohabitation with Robert and Jessica began smoothly. Linda, however, laid down some ground rules. My room is off limits. You can tell the difference between my stuff and mom's, right? Okay, okay, Jessica chirped cheerfully. We'll be careful. You really don't like people touching your things, huh? Looking back, this might have been the first sign of friction. Robert and Jessica lived on the second floor, where Linda's room was located. Initially, Jessica seemed like a dream housemate. She tackled chores with gusto, finishing cleaning and laundry before heading out for job hunting in the afternoons. In the evenings, she'd help prepare dinner. Susan, your cooking is amazing, she'd gush. My parents never cooked. It's great being in the kitchen with you. Can I try this? Her friendliness was disarming, like a cuddly kitten. Within days, I understood why Robert was smitten. Two weeks in, Jessica announced a part-time job. Shipping interior goods. Sounds fun, right? Five days a week, nine to six, I'll work hard. Are you sure? I questioned. Don't overexert yourself. It's okay, she insisted. For our future, after all. But I might not be able to help as much with housework. Her determination was admirable. No problem, I decided. Focus on your job. I'll handle the chores. The first few weeks are always challenging. With Linda helping on weekends, it was manageable. Jessica started coming home exhausted from work, solidifying my decision to take over the housework. One day, I heard raised voices. Hey, Jessica, Linda barked. I told you not to touch my stuff. My makeup's been going missing. I'm so sorry, Jessica pleaded with her puppy dog eyes. I'm saving for the future. I won't do it again. Linda wasn't convinced. Don't use other people's things just because you're saving. Do it again, and I'll ask Robert for the money. Jessica apologized profusely, but my trust in her was shaken. Linda's frustration was evident in the following days. The once cheerful apologies and playful banter turned into a constant undercurrent of tension. One Sunday evening, the tension exploded. Linda was folding laundry. Jessica, fold your own clothes. Starting a job doesn't mean a free pass on chores, right? I'm sorry, Jessica mumbled, her eyes welling up. Just got lazy. I'll do it now. Please forgive me. Robert, oblivious, intervened. Hey, Linda. No need to be harsh. Just help her out. He wrapped a comforting arm around Jessica, who gazed up at him tearfully. Jessica, he said. 
I'm sorry about my family. The seeds of doubt were firmly planted. Could Linda be right? Tension crackled in the air as Robert and Jessica left for their evening out. Let's go out for dinner tonight, Robert had announced. But Mom, Linda, if you bully Jessica... Bully? I scoffed as the door slammed shut. Linda's just trying to establish boundaries. You're too soft on her. Linda, chewing her lip, remained silent. A gnawing suspicion had taken root in my mind ever since she'd tearfully confided in me about Jessica's hidden temper. Dinner for two, then, I declared, marching toward the kitchen. And Linda, darling, there's something we need to discuss. Earlier, unable to shake off Linda's story, I'd planted a voice recorder in her room. The harsh words it captured, far worse than Linda had described, confirmed my growing unease. Now, another manipulation was unfolding. I want you to stay with your Aunt Mary for a while, I announced, ignoring Linda's spluttering protests. It's temporary, just until they find a place. Jessica's calculated provocations, coupled with Robert's blind defense, were crystal clear. She needed to be the victim, Linda the villain. I wouldn't allow it. The urgency in my voice seemed to register with Linda, a silent nod, a flicker of despair in her eyes. I pulled her into a hug. We'll be back to normal soon, honey. This charade needed to end. Three months left in our agreement, but every day felt like an eternity. With Linda gone, Jessica shed her pretense. No more snide remarks, just a relaxed veneer that sent shivers down my spine. Yet she continued to call me mom, the words laced with an unsettling sweetness. It feels lonely without Linda, Jessica purred, batting her eyelashes. Think of me as your real daughter? The sentiment felt sinister. Was she suggesting Linda wouldn't return? A cold dread washed over me. Days blurred into weeks as Jessica's demands escalated. Susan, iron my blouse. Susan, can we shop? To an outsider, we might have looked like a picture-perfect mother-daughter duo. But the closer she got, the more I recoiled. The charm had worn thin, revealing a cunning manipulator who preyed on kindness. Then, a pattern emerged. On nights Robert worked late, Jessica returned even later, occasionally requesting loans. My internal conflict intensified. Hold out a little longer, I kept telling myself. Linda's visits offered a lifeline. One Saturday, over steaming mugs of tea, she dropped a bombshell. Mom, I hired a private investigator. Jessica, she's a liar. The truth was astonishing. A three-day-a-week job, the rest spent meeting men. Not romantic entanglements, but seemingly transactional relationships, funding her lavish lifestyle. Robert, it seemed, was just another source of income. My heart ached for my son, blind to the web of deceit he called marriage. Linda's voice hardened. She has someone else, Mom, someone she truly loves, and Robert, she choked back a sob. He's just a convenient ATM. Fury and a fierce protectiveness for my family ignited within me. No more patience, no more playing fair. We need evidence, I declared, a newfound resolve filling my voice, enough to expose her and protect Robert. Linda's eyes mirrored my determination. We were a united front once again. Time to end this charade and ensure Jessica wouldn't hurt him anymore. As weeks turned into days, a question gnawed at me. Found a place yet? I asked nonchalantly during dinner, the deadline looming. We don't want to overstay our welcome after all. The looking for a house charade had grown tiresome. Months had passed since Robert and Jessica moved in, and I hadn't heard a peep about their progress. Any luck with the house hunt? I'd casually ask during dinner. Robert, ever the mediator, would answer vaguely. Yeah, we checked out some places near my office last week, found a few good ones, so Jessica and I will go for a viewing soon. That's good to hear, I'd reply, a flicker of doubt lingering in my heart. One evening, Robert dropped a bombshell. What? Robert, you said you'd leave it to me, Jessica sputtered. I like it here. Linda moved out, so why can't we just stay? My jaw clenched. It seemed Jessica had never intended to leave. My tolerance for her recent demands, fueled by the belief it was temporary, evaporated. No, I said firmly. We have an agreement. And the only reason Linda left was to appease your constant need for privacy. Well, there's no place better than this one, Jessica countered, her voice laced with entitlement. The air crackled with tension. This was the first time I'd seen a disgruntled expression mar her usually sweet facade. We can't stay here, Jessica, 
Robert pleaded, his voice strained, even if it means paying a bit more in rent. Frustrated, Jessica stormed off upstairs. Perhaps that was the turning point, because a few days later, disaster struck. I was carrying a load of laundry down from the second floor balcony, a stack of heavy sheets threatening to topple over. Careful, Susan, Jessica called out. Let me help you with that. Relief washed over me. Thank you, I mumbled, handing her the laundry. As she took it, a chilling smile played on her lips. Susan, she purred, I always get what I want no matter what. Confusion clouded my mind. What did she mean? Before I could decipher her cryptic words, Jessica threw herself down the stairs, still clutching the laundry. Mom, stop it! Robert's panicked cry echoed through the house. Frozen in shock, I watched as Jessica tumbled down the steps with a sickening thud. Robert rushed to her side, shouting for an ambulance. Alone in the aftermath, fear gnawed at me. I called Linda, my voice trembling as I recounted the bizarre scene. Mom, it's okay, she reassured me. I need to check something, then I'll be there. The rest of the evening blurred by. When I heard the front door open, I rushed to see Robert and Jessica standing there. Relief washed over me until I noticed Jessica's left leg immobilized in a cast, crutches holding her upright. Seeing Jessica so hurt, I stammered, approaching her. What nerve do you have to ask that? Robert snarled, cutting me off. Jessica said you pushed her down the stairs. We're pressing charges. Disbelief flooded my face. But I wouldn't do that, I sputtered. Jessica, what's going on? Before she could speak, Robert launched into a tirade. I've heard about your mistreatment of Jessica for a while now, he accused, his voice thick with anger. But she always defended you. His words stung, but paled in comparison to the chilling scene that unfolded next. Robert's face contorted in rage. He lunged at me, his fist connecting with my jaw. Tears welled up in my eyes as I tasted blood. This wasn't my son anymore. And yet, to think you'd push her down the stairs, Robert choked out, tears welling up in his own eyes. It's a lie, I screamed. Behind them, Jessica leaned on her crutches, a sickeningly sweet smile playing on her lips. Her innocent facade shattered, revealing a cunning manipulator who had played us all. A cold dread gripped me. Jessica wasn't the victim. She was the mastermind. And the game had just begun. Chaos erupted in the living room. A scream, sharp and echoing, pierced the air. My heart hammered against my ribs as Robert thrust his phone into my face. The screen displayed a horrifying scene. Jessica tumbling down the stairs, my figure looming ominously above her. Robert, stop it! Linda burst in, her voice laced with urgency. She rushed to my side, her eyes wide with alarm, and dabbed at the blood trickling down my cheek. Beside her stood a uniformed police officer. Arrest her! Robert roared, oblivious to the growing confusion. The one who needs arresting isn't Mom, Linda countered, her jaw set. Huh? Robert sputtered, bewildered. I've got evidence, this video. Panic constricted my throat. The single captured moment painted me as a villain. Linda and the officer huddled around the phone, scrutinizing the footage. It's so clear from this angle, the officer murmured, a frown etching lines on his face. Looks like you pushed her. I wanted to scream, to defend myself, but a wave of nausea washed over me. Just then, Linda spoke, her voice calm and resolute. But what if we looked at it from a different perspective? Jessica's eyes flitted to Linda, a flicker of unease crossing her face. Linda whipped out her phone, a triumphant glint in her eyes. After I moved out, she explained, I had a hunch about Jessica, so I installed security cameras around the house. Robert stared at Linda, his face unreadable. Wait a minute, Jessica sputtered. Isn't that an invasion of privacy? Oh, weren't you doing the same thing? Linda countered sharply. Jessica grimaced, suddenly speechless. Linda played the footage from her camera. This view, taken from the opposite side of the stairs, concealed behind a family photo frame, revealed a chilling truth. It was clear. Jessica had deliberately thrown herself down. The audio track, clearer from this angle, captured Jessica's muttered plan. This should do it. Now to get rid of Robert, too. Relief washed over me in waves, so powerful it almost made me weak. Tears welled up in my eyes as Linda's quick thinking exposed Jessica's web of deceit. Jessica, 
Robert breathed, his voice devoid of anger, only a profound disillusionment. You wanted to live here with someone else. Jessica's carefully constructed facade crumbled. It's not what you think, Robert, she stammered, her voice cracking. I did all this for us, for you and me. Linda stepped forward, her gaze unwavering. She's got two other guys she's seeing, Robert. Rich old men, I have proof. Jessica lashed out, desperate to salvage her lies. No, Linda is just trying to frame me. Robert, believe only in me. But Robert's trust had shattered. You sure about that, Susan? He asked, turning to me. I am, I confirmed, a newfound resolve in my voice. And I have something that will prove Jessica's true intentions. I retrieved my phone from my pocket. Linda and Robert exchanged surprised looks. Noah, I said, pronouncing the name with a sense of finality. A tremor of fear flickered across Jessica's face, a telltale sign. Noah, Robert echoed, confused. I explained my visit to the bar where Noah worked. He readily confirmed Jessica's obsessive behavior towards him, revealing her true motive for the elaborate charade. As Noah's voice filled the room, detailing Jessica's desperation and negligible spending, the color drained from Jessica's face. Robert watched the spectacle unfold, a mixture of anger and hurt etched on his face. Jessica's final attempt at manipulating Robert, the supposed love for him, lay in ruins. The officer stepped forward, his hand resting gently but firmly on Jessica's shoulder. You're under arrest for attempted fraud and assault. Jessica's pleas fell on deaf ears. The truth had finally been brought to light, and the consequences for her scheming were swift and undeniable. Relief and a sliver of justice warmed my heart as the officer led Jessica away. The nightmare was finally over. As the officer led Jessica away, her defiance echoed in the room. We'll get the rest at the station, he muttered, his voice heavy with authority. Robert, however, seemed lost in a different reality. Jessica, he began, his voice strained. Didn't I tell you? You can't live here. The house belongs to Linda. Jessica whirled around, her face contorted with rage. What the hell? She screamed, spitting out the words with venomous fury. So all this for nothing? Broken leg, elaborate charades? For a house that's not even yours? The officer tightened his grip, fearing she might lunge at Robert. Her tirade continued, a torrent of insults aimed at Robert. Worthless old man, she spat, venom dripping from her voice. The scene was both horrifying and pathetic. It was clear Jessica's carefully constructed world had crumbled around her. In the aftermath, a stunned silence descended upon the house. Tears streamed down Robert's face, the weight of his disillusionment evident. We embraced, a silent acknowledgement of the ordeal we'd narrowly escaped. We were a family on the precipice, almost shattered by Jessica's deceit. My initial relief morphed into a deep well of fear. How could I have been so blind? I had welcomed a serpent into my own home, jeopardizing the fragile peace we had built. Justice, however slow, prevailed. Linda's meticulously gathered evidence, paired with the damning footage, ensured a smooth separation. Robert and Jessica divorced, a fitting end to their twisted charade. Looking back, the memory of Jessica's manic grin as she plunged down the stairs still sends shivers down my spine. Linda's foresight, the hidden camera, had saved me from a web of lies. Who knows what horrors Jessica might have unleashed if it hadn't been caught on film. For a while, the three of us cohabitated. Robert, scarred by the experience, eventually received a transfer. Enough of marriage, he declared his voice thick with cynicism. As a mother, I couldn't help but hope he would someday find happiness again. Today, Linda and I remain in the house. Jessica's ghosts linger in the echoes of her manipulative schemes, but they no longer hold power. While I secretly wish for Linda to find her happily ever after, our peaceful life together brings a deep sense of contentment. Story 4 my husband exclaimed in disbelief, asking how I could do such a thing. I gave him the cake and he began trembling right away. John's roar echoed through the kitchen. Apologize to Emily, what have you done? To an outsider, I might have looked like a villain tossing a cake box into the trash like a petulant child. But I knew better. Emily's intentions, as veiled as the frosting on that cake, were far from sweet. Eat it then, I countered, snatching the box from the bin. 
If the cake's so good, why throw it away? A defiant glint sparked in my eyes as I shoved a slice into John's mouth. He gagged, eyes bulging. See? What's in this? Let me introduce myself. Alice Johnson, 35, maternity leave nurse, currently 10 months pregnant and teetering on the edge. John, my husband of two years, works at a staffing agency. We craved a baby for so long, endured fertility scares, and finally, this year, our miracle arrived. Yet, amidst the joy lurked a shadow. Emily, John's daughter from his previous marriage. Our love story began innocently enough on a dating app. Not a serious, ring-on-the-finger kind, but a place for casual connections. John's profile was bland. A sprinkle of hobbies, a dash of career info. No hint of a past life. We clicked, went on dates, and fell for his boyish charm. Then came the bombshell. Let's get married, but... John's voice faltered. I have a daughter, Emily. Stunned silence. Looking back, the app felt like a misleading gateway into a complicated reality. Here I was, blissfully unaware, while John withheld a crucial detail in this supposedly casual setting. I didn't answer, needing time to process the weight of his confession. Fast forward to today. A ticking time bomb disguised as a birthday cake. It arrived courtesy of Emily a 12-year-old with a knack for passive aggression. John, ever the pushover, saw it as a peace offering, oblivious to the potential allergens lurking inside. My doctor had warned me, careful with your diet, Alice, you're borderline anemic. Emily's concoction, with its suspicious color and artificial sheen, screamed trouble. John's accusation stung, but motherhood fueled my defiance. This wasn't about a cake, it was about protecting our fragile family. Emily's presence, a constant reminder of John's past, often left me questioning our future. Did I truly belong in this picture? The incident with the cake was a turning point. The fight that erupted laid bare the fault lines in our marriage. John, caught between his daughter and his pregnant wife, appeared helpless. As for me, the stress of pregnancy mixed with the simmering resentment towards Emily threatened to consume me. We had a lot to unpack. Emily's manipulative tactics, John's naivety, and my own insecurities. It wouldn't be easy, but for the sake of our baby and ourselves, we had to navigate this minefield together. Our love story began with a delightful irony. John's dating app profile, a bland concoction of hobbies and career details, offered no hint of the surprise waiting just around the corner. We clicked, dates turned into love, and I fell for his charmingly boyish demeanor. Then came the bombshell. Let's get married. John stammered, but there's something you should know. I have a daughter, Emily. Silence stretched, thick and heavy. The app, designed for casual connections, suddenly felt like a misleading bridge to a complex reality. John, caught off guard by his own omission, had withheld a crucial detail in this supposedly casual setting. I needed time to process the weight of his confession. Fast forward, and I'm Alice, a 35-year-old pregnant nurse teetering on the edge. John, my husband of two years, beams with anticipation for our impending arrival. However, a shadow lurks amidst the joy. Emily, his 12-year-old daughter from his previous marriage. Our first encounter was a chilling introduction to the challenges ahead. Emily, a whirlwind of short hair and tan skin, stared at me with a nervousness that morphed into a snicker. Dad would bring someone younger, she quipped, her voice laced with teenage malice. He likes young women, you know. My mom had me when she was 18. Aren't you almost 40? A cold dread seeped into my bones. These weren't words a child should hurl at someone who might become her stepmother. John, caught off guard, offered a weak defense, leaving me feeling exposed and vulnerable. Life with Emily was a daily barrage of microaggressions. My late work hours, a necessity of my demanding job, were met with accusations of incompetence. My attempts at home-cooked meals were met with disdainful critiques. My every move felt scrutinized, my existence a constant irritant. The stress, coupled with the ongoing struggles to conceive, took a toll on my health. When anemia landed me in the hospital, Emily's only comment, delivered in a saccharine tone when John was around, was, finally, some peace and quiet. But in his absence, she reveled in my misery. John, oblivious to the undercurrent of tension, started working late, sometimes disappearing overnight. While a seed of suspicion about infidelity flickered in my mind, 
something deeper told me it wasn't another woman. Then, the miracle we'd longed for arrived, a tiny heartbeat blossoming within me. Yet Emily's harassment escalated. My morning sickness became an excuse for her demands. My fatigue met with taunts. The constant pressure pushed me to a breaking point. The day of the discarded cake wasn't just about a sugary concoction. It was a symbol of my mounting frustration, the culmination of Emily's relentless attacks, and the weight of John's obliviousness. It was a cry for help, a desperate plea for a life free from this suffocating tension. The incident shattered the fragile equilibrium of our home. John, caught between his daughter and his pregnant wife, appeared helpless. As for me, the stress of pregnancy mixed with the simmering resentment towards Emily threatened to consume me. My growing belly strained against the countertop as I attempted to cook dinner. Morning sickness had left me hypersensitive to strong smells, forcing me to cut back on seasoning. Needs more salt, Emily sneered, popping a stray chip into her mouth. I stifled a sigh. The girl had the empathy of a brick wall. As I entered my tenth month, a constant low hum of anticipation thrummed within me. The baby felt ready to burst forth any day now. While ultrasounds showed healthy growth, dizzy spells due to anemia became more frequent. Standing for too long in the kitchen sent the world spinning. You okay, Alice? John asked one evening, concern etched on his face. My last doctor's visit echoed in my mind. The anemia is manageable, but be cautious. Trying to project normalcy, I mumbled, just a little lightheaded. It'll pass. I brushed it off, hoping stillness would do the trick. Neglecting to follow the doctor's advice proved a mistake. Stepping out of the bathroom one day, a wave of nausea washed over me, draining the color from my face. Before I could reach for support, darkness engulfed me. The last thing I registered was Emily, a flicker of amusement dancing in her eyes. Consciousness returned to the sterile white of a hospital room. The telltale scent of disinfectant confirmed my fears. A kind nurse appeared, her smile reassuring. Mrs. Johnson, you're awake? You fainted due to anemia, but your baby is fine. You were lucky to be at home. Relief washed over me. I'd fainted, been hospitalized. Emily must have called the ambulance. Yet the image of her smirk lingered, a disturbing echo. Hospitalization seemed a small price compared to facing Emily at home, especially with John's increasingly late nights. The thought of enduring her taunts until the baby arrived filled me with dread. Rest, the nurse advised, before leaving me alone with my churning thoughts. In the quiet absence of Emily, a wave of exhaustion pulled me under. Five days turned into a week. The bland but nutritious hospital meals were a blessing, a welcome respite from household chores. However, sleep was elusive. My protruding belly made finding a comfortable position a nightly quest. The anemia lingered, a constant reminder of my health and vulnerability. Yesterday, a call from a friend added another layer of unease. After catching up, she dropped a bombshell. Rumors about John swirling around the office. My heart pounded in my chest, her words echoing against a backdrop of doubt. Could it be true? Sleep had been a distant dream that night. As I delved into a book today, the door creaked open. I expected a nurse, but it was Emily. Feeling better, Alice? She chirped, her voice oddly cheerful. Taken aback, I stammered, Yes, thanks for calling the ambulance. A small part of me felt compelled to express gratitude. Emily's response was a verbal slap. Didn't do it for you. Just didn't want you lying there messing up the floor. Maybe I should have left you. Her usual venom was laced with a new layer of spite. A cold dread settled in my stomach. What was going on with her? The air crackled with a tension thicker than hospital disinfectant. John entered, a sheepish grin plastered on his face. Sorry, just had to use the restroom. His eyes darted around the room and landed on the cake box in my hand. You're back, Emily. It's been a while. Emily puffed out her chest proudly. Yeah, I got Alice a get well gift. John's smile faltered for a brief moment, but I barely noticed. A cold dread settled in my stomach as I observed their exchange. Something about the cake, the timing, the forced cheer, it all reeked of a twisted plan. Eat the cake, Alice. John urged, a hint of forced casualness in his voice. If you don't, it'll go bad. My gaze flickered between them, suspicion hardening into certainty. This wasn't a regular cake. 
It was a weapon, a silent threat wrapped in sugary deception. Well then, you eat the cake, I countered, my voice laced with defiance. If he's so worried about it spoiling, it must be delicious. Reaching into the box, I grabbed a slice and shoved it into John's mouth before he could protest. He gagged, his face contorting in disgust. His eyes bulged before rolling back in his head, and he started to shake uncontrollably. Fear momentarily replaced suspicion. See? I spat, my voice trembling. What did she put in it? Emily, who had been watching with morbid curiosity, rushed over to John. Dad, are you okay? She shrieked, feigning concern. John sputtered, finally regaining his composure. Just tasted awful, he mumbled, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. I stared at the cake box, a horrifying epiphany dawning on me. This wasn't a prank. It was a calculated attempt to harm me, my baby. My anger surged, hot and raw. Awful, I roared, turning towards Emily. You're the one who brought this monstrosity. What did you even put in it? Emily's bravado faltered under my piercing gaze. She hesitated, shifting her weight from one leg to another. The silence stretched, thick with tension. Hesitant, I muttered, holding the cake closer to my nose. The smell that hit me was a grotesque cocktail of stale beer and burnt coffee. A closer look revealed a sliver of pink peeking out from the cake's spongy interior. Disbelief turned to nausea. Raw meat? The absurdity of it all was almost comical. It wasn't a gourmet cake that could make John sick. It was a deliberate concoction designed to be harmful for a pregnant woman. The alcohol, the caffeine, the raw meat, a recipe for food poisoning at best. But at worst, it could have harmed the baby. The anger in my chest simmered over. This wasn't some childish prank. This was a deliberate act, orchestrated by Emily, with John's silent consent or worse, active participation. You both made this, didn't you? I accused them, my voice shaking with a mixture of rage and hurt. Tried to trick me into eating something that could hurt the baby? Emily opened her mouth to stammer a denial, but the words wouldn't come. John, however, remained silent, his gaze fixed on the floor. The truth hung heavy in the air, suffocating and undeniable. Emily, I began, a newfound resolve hardening my voice. Why? Why do you hate me so much that you'd try something like this? The revelation hung heavy in the air. Emily, cornered by my accusation, mumbled a childish retort. Because you're in the way, Alice. I never asked for a new mom. Hurt flickered across my face. Accepting a new stepmother was a big adjustment. But it was Emily who'd refused to meet me initially. And the bratty behavior, the constant jabs, the snide comments, was all entirely one-sided. We need to get something straight, Emily, I said, my voice surprisingly calm despite the churning in my stomach. When have I ever called you a brat? You can't just twist things around to make yourself the victim here. What do you know? She spat, her voice cracking. Even Dad doesn't like you. John, drained after the ill-fated cake incident, looked like he wanted to disappear into the floorboards. I had something more pressing to address. So, I hear you got fired from your job, John. He flinched, his eyes widening momentarily. Emily, caught off guard, shot him a surprised look. What? Fired? A friend called me yesterday, I explained. We hadn't spoken in a while, but it turns out she works at the same company as you. Ms. Young? John's breath hitched. Young? The manager? Yes, I continued, my gaze unwavering. Manager Young told me about the embezzlement. The late nights weren't work after all, were they? Gambling? Trying to recoup your losses? John opened his mouth to protest, but the words wouldn't come. The truth was evident on his face, a reflection of the monstrous cake Emily had brought. Wanting me out of the picture for a quick payout aligned perfectly with Emily's animosity. Their plan was simple. Get me to eat the harmful concoction, collect the life insurance money, and walk away unscathed. A cold fury washed over me. And the monthly payments? Were they just loans to cover the missing funds? You were planning on getting a payout from my death, weren't you? John's eyes darted between me and Emily, the horror slowly dawning on both their faces. With that, the truth was out in the open, suffocating and undeniable. This isn't a family anymore, I stated, my voice laced with steel. 
I want a divorce, John, and I'll be seeking compensation for your deceit and Emily's harassment, as well as child support. You don't get a say in this. Their defenses crumbled. Unfair, Emily shrieked. What about Dad? How will he provide without a job? Unfair? I countered, my voice rising a notch. You both plotted to kill me. That's the real injustice. I won't raise my child under the same roof as you two. The audacity of their accusations fueled my resolve. I pointed towards the door. Leave! Their eyes wide with fear, John and Emily scurried out of the room. The exertion triggered a sharp pain in my abdomen. Grimacing, I slammed the call button for the nurse. The truth bomb finally detonated. My labor had begun. The following week, I left the hospital with my newborn nestled in my arms. A lawyer's business card, clutched tightly in my hand, was a symbol of my new life. John looked desolate, but upon seeing the card, his face drained of color. His pleas for forgiveness fell on deaf ears. News traveled fast. Through a neighbor, I learned that John, saddled with debt and now facing alimony and child support, had resorted to borrowing heavily to meet my demands. The elaborate scheme for a quick payout had backfired spectacularly. The fallout was swift and brutal. John, already drowning in debt from the embezzlement, was saddled with the crushing weight of alimony, child support, and the exorbitant interest rates of loan sharks. His elaborate scheme for a quick payout had become a financial nightmare. Rumors about Emily's poison cake spread like wildfire, likely started by someone who overheard whispers at the hospital. Once the schoolyard got hold of the story, Emily became a pariah. The whispers and stares drove her into seclusion, a stark contrast to her initial bravado. The once haughty teenager was forced to drop out of school and find a part-time job. While it was a sad turn of events, perhaps this new reality would serve as a harsh but necessary life lesson. For me, the aftermath brought a newfound sense of security. Nestled back in my parents' home, I cradled my newborn, their gurbling coos a melody far sweeter than any argument. Parenthood, of course, presented its own challenges. Sleepless nights and endless diaper changes were a constant test, but the love I felt for my child eclipsed every moment of exhaustion. Once the baby settled into a routine, I planned to return to work. The future stretched before me, filled with the promise of quality time with my child, supportive parents, and a newfound confidence. The ordeal had been life-altering, but I emerged stronger, ready to navigate the joys and challenges of motherhood with the love and support of my family. Story 5 After my father passed away, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law moved into my high-rise apartment without my permission. The air hung heavy with unspoken emotions as I sat nestled in my luxury apartment, the once warm space now feeling sterile and cold. My father's passing was still raw, and his absence echoed in the deafening silence. Then the front door creaked open, and my in-laws, Martha and Richard, swept in, their arrival a discordant note in the somber symphony of grief. Kathy, dear, Martha cooed, her voice dripping with saccharine sympathy. We thought we'd come help you settle things. Their arrival wasn't a surprise. It was more of an unwelcome intrusion. The way Martha lingered over the mahogany furniture, her eyes gleaming with avarice, was as clear as her poorly veiled condolences. Across the room, Richard chuckled, his laugh echoing hollowly. Family needs to stick together, wouldn't you agree, Ken? He boomed, his gaze landing on my husband, who sat hunched over his phone, oblivious to the drama unfolding around him. A bitter laugh escaped my lips. Family, I scoffed, the word tasting like ashes in my mouth. This penthouse is for immediate family, and right now that's just me. My words hung in the air, punctuated by the rhythmic tapping of Ken's thumbs on his phone screen. Here was the real tragedy. Not just my father's death, but the slow, agonizing demise of my marriage. Ken, once the charming prince with a million-watt smile, had morphed into a distant stranger, perpetually tethered to his phone. Our conversations, once filled with laughter and whispered secrets, had dwindled to one-sided soliloquies, my concerns echoing in the void where his attention used to be. How did it come to this? I rewound the tape, revisiting the early days of our whirlwind romance. At 29, still focused on my career, I'd sworn off relationships. 
Then, fate, or perhaps my meddling friend Sarah, intervened. She introduced me to Ken, a handsome, successful man who seemed to check all the boxes. Our dates were meticulously planned affairs, filled with fancy dinners and breathtaking cityscapes. He showered me with compliments, his words smooth and persuasive. You're my destiny, Kathy, he'd proclaimed, his voice oozing confidence. His charm was potent, masking a subtle undercurrent that made me question my worth. He portrayed marriage as a practical arrangement, one devoid of messy emotions. Blinded by his facade, I'd ignored the warning bells, silencing my anxieties. And so we were married, a union built on shaky foundations of convenience rather than love. But love, it seemed, wasn't Ken's game. Over the years, the sparkle in his eyes dimmed, replaced by a dull indifference. Our nights were spent in separate, cold silence. His phone became his constant companion, a barrier that effectively shut me out. The sting of betrayal mixed with the ache of grief, a potent cocktail that threatened to drown me. Martha's presence, meant to be comforting, only fueled my rage. These vultures, circling my misfortune, waiting to pick at the remnants of my life. No, this wasn't over. I wouldn't let them take over my home, my life. A fire rekindled within me, a spark of defiance. It was time to reclaim what was rightfully mine. My world tilted on its axis the morning after the wedding. Gone was the charming, attentive Ken, who'd swept me off my feet. Standing in our new kitchen, a breakfast feast spread before him, I met a man shrouded in a dark cloud. Are you telling me to eat this? He barked, his irritation a stark contrast to the vows whispered just hours earlier. Puzzled, I stammered an explanation. Just thought you might like a good breakfast. Bacon, eggs, toast. Coffee and toast, he interrupted, his voice clipped. That's all I have time for. Can't read the newspaper with a plate in my hand, can I? His words, laced with a hint of mockery, stung deep. Leisurely and inefficient, huh? I mumbled, the fairy tale image of our future crumbling around me. He gave me a curt nod, his smile devoid of warmth. I like that look on you, dumbfounded. Then he vanished out the door, leaving me staring at the untouched food. My carefully curated vision of married life shared mornings, lingering conversations, lay shattered in the cold light of day. The day stretched before me with the weight of unfulfilled hope. As I contemplated cleaning the leftover wedding decorations, the doorbell rang. Opening the door, I was greeted by my mother-in-law, Martha, and her younger daughter, Amy. They barged in without a word, their arrival an unwelcome intrusion. Kathy, Martha declared, a condescending smile plastered on her face. I hear you tried buttering up Ken with that breakfast this morning. He's not one for elaborate meals, dear. Amy, perched on the arm of a nearby chair, chimed in with a sneer. He already had breakfast at home. How quaint, considering your newlyweds. Their words burned. Not only did they invade my privacy, but they exposed Ken's pre-dawn visit to his family, confirming a growing suspicion, their unwavering disapproval. Amy cast a disdainful glance around the room. Looks like you haven't finished unpacking. Her tone dripped with judgment. Before I could defend myself, Martha interjected. No excuses, dear. A woman like you, an office worker, needs to prioritize. Her voice dripped with an icy disdain. We took you in, remember? Show some gratitude. Now make us some tea. My hands trembled as I obeyed. As I poured the steaming liquid... Martha took a sip, then chuckled. Bland, you'd think someone who served tea wouldn't get it so wrong. Amy giggled in agreement, their laughter like nails on a chalkboard. Their veiled insults hung in the air. Is Ken sure about this? Amy quipped, her eyes flicking between me and Martha. She seems, well, let's just say they compliment each other, Martha replied enigmatically. Their cryptic words were unsettling, yet I was powerless to question them in front of Ken's family. Especially not Amy, a jobless, idol-obsessed 20-something whose life was hardly a model for success. This wasn't the life I'd envisioned. The dream of a honeymoon period evaporated, replaced by a suffocating reality. Ken's disdain, coupled with my in-law's constant sniping, created a toxic atmosphere. Divorce, however, was an unmentionable option so soon after the wedding. Six months flew by in a blur of emotional turmoil, then a glimmer of hope, 
a positive pregnancy test. The birth of Emily, my beautiful daughter, brought a measure of peace to the household. While my in-law's snide remarks didn't completely vanish, their focus shifted. Korean dramas became their new obsession, their days consumed by televised romances and fan events. It was a bizarre turn of events, but it meant Emily and I were left relatively unscathed. While I yearned for a closer relationship with Emily's grandmother, the distance provided a fragile sense of harmony. It wasn't ideal, but for now, it was enough. 23 years. That's how long I'd been married to Ken. A journey that landed somewhere between comfortable routine and quiet disappointment. While fireworks and passionate declarations had given way to a predictable rhythm of life, I thought we were settled. Two ships passing in the night, content on parallel courses. Then, out of the blue, amidst the comfortable silence, came a question so unexpected it made me question my hearing. Should we move in together? Ken's voice, usually reserved for work calls or terse greetings, seemed to reverberate in the living room. What? I stammered, a blush creeping up my neck. With your mom? He chuckled, a rare sound that surprised me as much as his words. No, Kathy, your father. He's rebuilding his house, isn't he? Thought we could lend him a hand while it's being done. I vaguely recalled mentioning my father's plans to build a new house at his advanced age. Ken, ever the stoic figure, hadn't seemed to register it then. Maybe, just maybe, he was actually listening. But living in a construction zone at his age? I trailed off, picturing the chaos and inconvenience. Exactly, Ken interjected. That's why I thought, we could all move in together temporarily. Besides, he added, his voice softening. Didn't you say the old house was falling apart? This unexpected proposal left me bewildered. My ideal living situation involved a modern condo, not sharing a house with my aging father. But, I started yet again. As if anticipating my objection, Ken continued. Look, long term, this would be our place. And... He added, with an uncharacteristic gentleness, I'm worried about you, Kathy. You've poured your heart into Emily these past years. Now that she's on her own, it's time for your own second chapter. A change of scenery might do you good. Tears welled up in my eyes. Behind Ken's stoic facade, there was a flicker of genuine care. This wasn't the first time he'd surprised me. My father, ecstatic with the idea, readily agreed. With remarkable speed, Ken secured a high-rise condo, a luxurious splurge that left me speechless. While his job at a prestigious corporation guaranteed a comfortable living, affording a high-rise apartment seemed extravagant. Managing our finances wasn't my responsibility. I received a monthly allowance, oblivious to the bigger picture. However, the astronomical price tag of the condo made me dizzy. Emily's gone, Ken explained, his voice devoid of the usual financial discussions we never had. This isn't a family-oriented space anymore. We deserve a little indulgence for our forever home. Unbeknownst to me, his discussions with my father had gone further. My dad, overjoyed with the prospect of living close by, had readily agreed to contribute financially. Despite my initial anxieties, the high-rise apartment proved remarkably comfortable. It felt like a fresh start, a promise of a happy second chapter after years of routine existence. However, the initial spark of connection with Ken soon fizzled. Our pre-condo conversations dwindled, replaced by his usual silence and his increasingly frequent late nights and business trips. Maybe he just feels awkward with your father around, my dad offered one day, his voice low with concern. He seemed to have shrunk in on himself, his once lively spirit dimmed. Dad, I prompted, what about the social dances and karaoke nights you used to enjoy? You haven't been since we moved. He shrugged a shadow flitting across his eyes. Stopped. Didn't feel like it anymore. But why? I pressed, a knot of worry tightening in my stomach. Just being with you two was enough, he mumbled, avoiding my gaze. His words hung heavy in the air, a testament to the unintended consequences of our well-meaning plan. Without his social outlets and purpose, my father's health deteriorated rapidly. Within a year, he was hospitalized. Walking into his room, I grabbed his pajamas from a drawer. A small bank book tucked away at the bottom caught my eye. Hesitantly, I peeked inside. The numbers on the page sent a jolt through me. Dad? I whispered, 
my voice thick with emotion. My father's revelation left me reeling. Despite the shock, his hand squeezing mine held a comforting warmth. A few days later, he passed away peacefully. When I informed Ken, his response was jarringly light. Oh, he said, sooner than I thought. Just as I started to sift through photo albums for his memorial service, a key turned in the lock, shattering the quiet. Expecting Ken, I froze as a cacophony of footsteps echoed through the house. Where should we put these boxes? A gruff voice boomed. A moving crew, followed by my mother-in-law, flooded the living room. Kathy, dear, she chirped, her smile strained. Amy and Ken are here. Boxes piled up like unwanted guests. Confusion gnawed at me. What's with all this? Can't you tell? Amy sneered, her words dripping with disdain. Maybe those office jobs really dull the senses. We're moving in. Their smug faces contorted into a shared smirk. Our deepest condolences on your loss? Amy said with mock sincerity. So sorry to be so blunt, but Kathy, you should probably leave now. My brows furrowed, incredulous. Beside me, Ken remained uncharacteristically silent. She doesn't get it, he finally chuckled, a sound devoid of humor. Someone spell it out for her. His mother leaned forward, her voice dripping with saccharine sympathy. We're family, dear, she said, enunciating each word carefully. Outsiders should leave. Amy stifled a giggle, her face turning crimson. But then the dam broke. She guffawed, a sound quickly joined by her mother. Standing amidst their callous laughter, I felt utterly alone. Tears welled up, but a fierce anger rose within me, pushing them back. Seeing my distress, Ken attempted a placating tone. Hey, don't be so down. You did everything you could for your dad. No regrets there. Now it's my turn to take care of things. Maybe you can stay with Emily, although... He trailed off, the unspoken doubt hanging heavy in the air. I held back the tears, the urge to lash out at them all, but instead, a single, defiant laugh escaped me. Wiping a stray tear, I looked them all in the eye. Please, I said, my voice surprisingly steady. Make yourselves at home. Ken and his family exchanged bewildered glances. Was I losing my mind? Ignoring their disgusted looks, I turned and walked out, slamming the door behind me. The audacity to claim they were somehow doing me a favor? The thought of their laughter echoing in my father's absence fueled a fire within me. They were vultures, feasting on his memory. I wouldn't let them have their victory lap. For the moment, I allowed them their delusion. I found refuge in a quiet hotel, planning my next move. The following Sunday, I arrived at the condo, keys clutched tightly in my hand. With a satisfying click, the door swung open, revealing a scene of domestic bliss. Amy, clad in oversized pajamas, shrieked in surprise as I marched in, a team of movers trailing behind. Ken and his mother looked up, confusion etched on their faces. Without a word, the movers began their professional ballet, methodically packing belongings into boxes. Excuse me, his mother sputtered, but this is rather rude. Shouldn't we have been notified? Actually, I countered, a steely edge in my voice. It seems you moved in without a word, remember? Amy's eyes widened in fury, mirroring her mother's expression. Ken, however, was the first to grasp the situation. Hold on, he yelled at the movers, his voice strained. Those are our things. But the movers, oblivious to the drama unfolding, continued their task. I seized the opportunity. Don't worry, I said, voice calm. They're just taking my belongings, and perhaps you could move the rest of your things to a storage unit. The movers nodded in unison and began dismantling furniture. What the hell are you doing? My mother-in-law shrieked, her facade of politeness crumbling. The real question, I retorted, voice steady despite the tremor in my hands, is what were you thinking? Amidst the chaos, a well-dressed man appeared at the doorway. Miss Johnson, he inquired, a smile plastered on his face. I'm from the real estate agency. We're here for the appraisal today. Ken's jaw hung slack, the business card from the real estate agent dangling limply in his hand. Oh, don't you get it? I said, the edge in my voice sharper than a knife. Maybe you're not that bright, Ken. This condo, it's getting sold. The shock on their faces, Ken, his mother, even Amy, was so comical I almost laughed. Why so surprised? I continued, my voice firm. 
This was my father's place. He bought it. You lot have no rights here. His mother, usually a picture of steely composure, clung to Ken, her voice dripping with faux sympathy. What's going on here, Kathy? Didn't we agree your father would contribute to the down payment? It seemed they'd conveniently forgotten the truth from the conversations I'd overheard. I took a deep breath. I thought Ken was being kind, suggesting we live with Dad. Turns out, you were all just after his money. The bomb dropped, Ken's face drained of color. My father's trust, misplaced and abused, churned my stomach with anger. Without my knowledge, I explained, my voice trembling slightly. Ken sweet-talked Dad into buying this condo. It was the price of admission for living together. He emptied all of Dad's savings on it. So what? Amy scoffed. It's better for an old man nearing the end to invest in a condo with us young folks than waste money on a silly house. You should be grateful to have a comfortable place with your father. Yes, I am, I retorted, grateful for the time I got to spend with him at the end. That's the point. The smug grin on Ken's face was infuriating. The image of Dad's bank book flashed in my mind, the first withdrawal coinciding with the condo purchase, followed by a steady stream depleting his pension. My father, robbed of his hobbies, his independence, his very security. You even took his pension as your living expenses, Ken, I accused, my voice tight with rage. How could you be so greedy? He couldn't meet my gaze, his silence a damning admission. But now, I continued, a steely glint in my eyes, I'm glad Dad bought this place. Being his only child, I inherit it, and I'm selling it. Wait, Ken stammered, a flicker of desperation replacing his earlier arrogance. If we'd contributed even a little, things would be different. And your ridiculous claim that we're strangers? I scoffed. The ones leaving are you three. His mother, ever the opportunist, tried to salvage the situation. All right, all right, she conceded, her voice oily. We were wrong. We apologize. Now stop being difficult, Kathy. It's just money. And your dear father's gone. Why blame Ken? Yes, Kathy, Amy chimed in, her voice dripping with fake sincerity. We're family, remember? We just wanted to be here for you, to help you cope with your loss. The audacity. After trying to throw me out, they were now playing the concerned family card. A humorless laugh escaped my lips. What do you think, Ken? I asked, turning to him. Am I a stranger to you? Is that what justifies a divorce? His shoulders slumped, the bluster gone. No, he mumbled. Of course not. I love you, Kathy. Selling the house is mean. The arrogant, distant Ken of years past was a ghost. Pity welled up within me, quickly swept away by a tide of anger. You love me? I said, the bitterness evident. Or is it the condo you love now that I've inherited it? Ken opened his mouth to protest, but I held up a hand, silencing him. Don't insult me further, Ken. With a dramatic flourish, I slammed several photos onto the table. Images of Ken, arm in arm with another woman, entering a hotel together. The blood drained from his face. How did you get these? He stammered, a desperate attempt to deflect. Your investment in Dad, I replied coldly. He gave them to me. Seems he had doubts. Doubts fueled by your erratic schedule and constant requests for money. I was blind, so trusting, numb to your strange behavior over the years. Ken's face crumpled, mirroring the photos in my hand. I don't know how long you've been cheating, I concluded. The evidence of Ken's betrayal wasn't the sleek lines of a sports car or a lipstick stain on his collar. It was crinkled photos, blurry and grainy, captured by my father's shaky phone camera during his nightly walks. Unskilled with technology, he documented everything. Stolen kisses, a clandestine hotel entrance, a silent collection fueled by growing suspicion. He'd planned to tell me, but on his final days, the words spilled out along with the financial truth. Divorce him, Kathy, he'd rasped, his voice weak. Before Ken could launch into a predictable apology, I cut him off. Think this is a negotiation? He gritted his teeth, a flicker of frustration breaking the facade. His mother, clinging to his arm like a lifeline, hissed in his ear. This wasn't the plan, she spat, venom lacing her words. We thought you'd be compliant. A maid, I finished the sentence for her, a cold clarity settling over me. 
Their expectations, the reason for the sudden chill after marriage, all clicked into place. My father, a surprising source of wealth, had turned me from a potential wife into a convenient servant. This is outrageous, she continued, eyes blazing. You used to be so agreeable. Age has gone to your head. You're ruining everything. Marital fraud, Ken piped up, his voice shaky. She deceived me. His mother, ever dramatic, dissolved into theatrical sobs on his chest. The urge to be merciful, to spare him further pain, warred with a newfound anger. A tea-serving maid? I scoffed. This isn't the 1950s. You reek of entitlement, and frankly, it's embarrassing. Her outburst had drained the fire from her son. He whimpered, tears welling up. You'd be nothing without me. Actually, Ken, I said, meeting his gaze. I work too. Remember the high rent for Emily's schooling? Back then, maybe I couldn't survive on my own salary, but things change. A single tear escaped his eye, quickly followed by another. I felt a surge of pity, but it was quickly overshadowed by determination. I earn enough for myself now. Raising a child and working was tough, but I wouldn't trade it. Thank you, Ken, for the memories. Goodbye. His mother glared daggers at me while Amy's true colors finally appeared. A wife shouldn't have an opinion. No money, no voice. That's how it should be. Her shrill voice echoed in the now empty condominium. The cries of his mother and the crumpled form of Amy were a testament to the family I was leaving behind. The sale of the condo and the divorce were surprisingly smooth. When I asked for a division of assets, Ken confessed, his voice strained. Please, Kathy, I barely have any savings left. It wasn't just his lavish spending fueled by deception, his salary was always a sham. Despite the prestigious company and his important position, he was stuck in a dead-end job, reliant on overtime he never worked. He was the office gopher, fetching coffee and making copies, while portraying the image of the high-powered businessman to maintain his charade. Ken's late nights and business trips were revealed in all their pathetic glory, excuses to spend time with his mistress. The image of him, past his prime, fetching coffee in a high-rise office, brought an involuntary chuckle to my lips. Three months later, he stood on my doorstep, a desperate plea hanging on his lips. Kathy, he stammered, can we, can we start over? The man who once lorded his corporate life over me now slunk in a cheap two-bedroom apartment with his equally bewildered mother and sister. They'd finally discovered the truth about his meager earnings, a stark contrast to the facade they'd built their lives on. My heart held no pity, only the quiet satisfaction of having shed a life that was built on lies. Their cramped apartment echoed with constant arguments. One day, Ken, pride bruised, simply walked out. Apparently, the lack of recognition at work, coupled with the dissolving marriage, was too much to bear. He vanished, fueled by the delusion that a second life awaited him with his mistress. Reality, however, proved harsher. Between his age, lack of a job, and dwindling funds, the fantasy quickly crumbled. The mistress, unsurprisingly, showed him the door. With nowhere else to turn, Ken reappeared at my doorstep, a desperate plea for a second chance hanging heavy in the air. The irony was laughable. The man who'd belittled my work and treated me like a maid now needed me. His request was met with a firm rejection. A defeated Ken slunk away, but the drama wasn't over. Soon, his mother and Amy materialized, their pleas echoing in the hallway. Apparently, Ken had crawled back to them, his grandiose plans in tatters. Now, however, their apartment echoed with a different kind of noise, Ken's self-proclaimed elite lifestyle. He bragged about me, painting a picture of a wealthy ex-wife while simultaneously squandering whatever money they had left. Their debt spiraled. Ken, in his delusional world, remained oblivious. His mother and Amy, unaccustomed to work, struggled through menial part-time jobs. It wasn't enough. I can't lend money to strangers, I told them, the irony not lost on me. Had they not treated me like an outsider during my marriage? The roles, it seemed, had reversed. Divorce had been a liberation. My small apartment was my sanctuary, free from the suffocating expectations of a loveless marriage. Emily, sensing the change in me, spent more and more time by my side. She, too, seemed lighter, free from the constant tension that had been her father's legacy. Mom, you've changed, Emily said one evening, 
her eyes twinkling. Really, I replied, surprised. Maybe your grandpa was watching over me, giving me the courage to change too, I said, a small smile playing on my lips. I handed her a bowl of steaming beef and potato stew, the warm aroma filling the room. Yes, I love your stew, she exclaimed, digging in. As I watched her happy face, a wave of contentment washed over me. It's wonderful to have someone who truly values you, I murmured. It brings so much vitality to life, Emily chimed in, her mouth full. I want to change even more. I want to be strong enough to protect the people I care about, especially you. Don't worry, I teased. I won't change the taste of the stew. Emily tilted her head, a mischievous glint in her eyes. That's good, she said, because it's perfect just the way it is. And in that quiet moment, with my daughter by my side, I knew this piece, this sense of belonging was something I would cherish forever.